when I said this, these lectures are open to all, I really don't think they're open to an 8 done. I, I don't think they'd actually learn anything from it. But I have had 6 and 7 dons appear before. But anyway, that aside. Uh, yes, when someone first asked me to do a lecture on finding or how to find the largest moves, I thought, like you, it was going to be a very specific lecture, it's going to be very, very easy, no problems, I was really, really wrong. Because essentially while I was planning this out, I noticed that this just kept spreading to every topic of Go that you can possibly imagine. So this really, really specific topic I was hoping to do just kind of exploded all over the place. So we'll see how this goes. Essentially, apparently, a lot of people want to know, how do you find the largest move within a Go game? Okay. We all can identify what's larger than other moves to a certain extent. For example, right now, if we were to open up with first line or second line moves, we all know that that's pretty small. In fact, even if we were as black to open up with dual third line stones, a lot of us would be kind of wondering where black really intends to go with that. Uh, third line is black is a little bit slow. Must have something special in mind for that particular opening. So, to an extent, we can all find uh, the slow move, or mm, some of the slower moves. And while I was playing this out, I realized that's kind of what this lecture began to revolve around. Not so much uh, finding the larger moves, but being able to identify the slow ones. Essentially like, um, it's kind of like I've always been saying, uh, getting better at Go isn't necessarily about finding the right move so much as punishing the bad ones. And up until the high dons, that's going to be absolutely true. So I think I'm going to focus on finding some smaller moves for that particular reason. I think that'll probably help the most amount of people. And hope that whoever suggested this topic, I don't think I see him in the list here. No, I don't. I hope that, you know, they're satisfied. So to that end, let's just play something uh, normal here. I'm going to avoid, like I always do, really, really unusual openings like uh, four fives or you know ten gen, whatever. That's no, that that's very special, and most of the rules would probably go out the window. And hello, SWAT cat. So immediately, I'm going to just set up something here, and. Uh, yeah, let's do this one first. Let's do this one first. And let's do that there. There we go. So right away, one easy way for me to find a uh, larger move is to essentially just, um, hmm, is to be uh, decisive. For example, let's say... Actually, this is going to get a little bit weirder. Let's undo you. There we go. Four fours all around. Let's say here is black. We've got pretty standard um, options available to us. We can make frameworks. How do we know that? Because if we were to actually use a rule, and we can do that occasionally, we can count out, you know, what's the largest area of the board, and that's probably where we should think about uh, playing a stone in the largest area. That's one way we can determine where we should be playing. And this, it'll, it's, it's a good rule. It's a good rule. There are kind of exceptions. We'll get into that a little bit. But uh, overall, pretty good rule. We could certain, So with that rule in mind, we could certainly uh, take a move that I hate, such as San Rensei. We can certainly approach... One move that I would probably say, yeah, I can't really flat out say it's bad. But you might see is this sort of halfway, which is not really approaching. 
and yet obviously not an enclosure, it's an extension. Can't really say it's bad, but uh, at least with my students, I try to steer them away from that particular idea. I usually like them to be a bit more decisive. Either take your enclosure, or go ahead and, you know, put pressure and approach. Do one or the other. Because when we start going into that whole middle of the road uh, theme, that's when we start getting into, or we can really easily fall into picking some slow moves, such as, um, let's say for the sake of argument, can I make this intelligent at all? Let's say for the sake of argument, let's give white something here. Um, let's give white maybe something like, I don't know what to give white. Maybe an enclosure here. Uh, we're going to make this really, really dumb. Let's make this a little bit weirder of an enclosure just for the sake of argument. And essentially a wall is all I'm really giving white here. Just a wall. And naturally with a wall, you typically don't want to approach very, very close. So a move like this, for example, might you might say that's out of the question completely because you don't want to get, you know, pincered and sandwiched against the wall and attacked like that. That'd be kind of uncomfortable. But at the same time, you might not want to simply enclose. So this is where we start getting, uh, if we're not careful, we kind of take that middle of the road path and try to do something that's not either one. We kind of try to pick a slow move. Uh, reason being here, it's not really in a, it's not really preventing an extension from uh, White's Little Wall. It's not really getting us territory because it's so open to invasion. It's just a, sort of a slow move. It's not really doing much of one or the other, and it's going to cause a very large headache for us. Because of that, I usually try and steer my students away from that so they don't find themselves uh, tempted to actually pick really, really bad moves like this. Because all that Aji essentially just keeps, you know, snowballing during a game, and then somewhere in the middle you're going to find yourself having... Um, it can be, yes. It very well can be. I mean, this is a faster move simply because you're not leaving that Aji behind. You're actually potentially getting some points here. Uh, let's back up real quick to my 4-4 example. There we go. So yeah, I usually try and uh, make my students pick a decisive move for that particular reason. So let's continue along. Let's say we were decisive and picked a Vera, the little Jaseki here. And let's see, do I want to leave that now or later? I think I will leave that uh, now. I mean, as white, for example, sometimes we're able to figure out where the largest move is simply by finding out what our opponent did not complete. Like, let's say your opponent decided to um, commit here on the lower right or the lower left, rather, but then tried to play a larger move elsewhere. So what's the largest move here? Do we immediately approach? Could be. Uh, approaching seems to be all right. Could do that, could do that. Do we try and make a framework of ourselves? Uh, I can, but that's giving our opponent time to go back and fix his problems because we played uh, the slow framework move on the left. In this instance, we would probably you like K3. Indeed. In this case, we would probably start looking uh, to what our opponent did not complete, and that is the Jaseki in the bottom left-hand corner here. And we would probably start uh, maybe with a move like Super Kalen recommended. We might pick one that limits... Uh, let's get rid of this real quick. Go away. Thank you very much. Might limit one that prevents our opponent from getting that nice uh, settled Jaseki here. 
while at the same time putting pressure on uh, those two stones, informing Black that we are well aware that he's trying to get away with an awful lot here. And we're going to put pressure on him and call him on it, see what he can actually do with these two stones that he left. So, right away, we've got two different ideas for uh, how to find larger moves, how to identify uh, slow ones. We can just, you know, do the whole counting thing and pick the move that's on the largest side of the board. Sorry, largest unoccupied side of the board. We can look at something that has been uh, left unfinished. In my opinion, it's probably faster. Or, don't really get into that phrase. Yeah, whatever. It's probably uh, faster to take advantage of something that's been left unfinished rather than to go and play, let's say, a Gote move elsewhere. Because in this way, Black gets to finish his framework. Now he's got a San Rinse with an extension on the bottom. He's pretty happy about that. Whereas here, he could have had the San Rinse and a group under attack, which is something he actually has to worry about. But if we play that Gote move elsewhere, completely different game. He gets to fix himself because we played a slow move. And we do see this quite a lot. Uh, things being left. We do, in fact, uh, see that. Let's say, for example, in... Uh, yeah, San Rensei. Oh, I'm sorry, do you not know that? Um, here we go. Those of you who aren't aware, three star points taken on the right-hand side like this is known as a San Rensei, essentially the three star points. Yep, no problem. But we do see this even in... Why do we... Um, I don't like it because it's something that I've seen and played since I was like 30Q, and I like getting into um, newer and exciting things, and I just find the San Rensei isn't that. It just doesn't uh, suit me because of that. But getting into a professional example, and yes, I'm taking this from, from a professional game. We've got Black playing uh, Orthodox Fuseki. We've got not that, that, that's bad, that's bad. We've got Inside Approach, which is very common nowadays. Not going to go over this for very long, because this is not what the topic of this is at all. All I'm going to do is uh, briefly go to my example. No, don't worry, this isn't getting complicated. Essentially what we have here is black trying to build up on the bottom. Normal Giuseppe right now would be to go ahead and settle. White gets the opportunity to kill the stones and settle. Black gets an opportunity to develop the bottom, take Sente for himself. This is one potentially normal sequence that we've been seeing a lot lately. White, however, decides that he's going to leave this for later. And instead plays on the bottom of the board. Makes certain that Black can't keep extending uh, his framework, since in this variation he's going to get Sente. And maybe he'll even take uh, the largest point, or a larger point, rather, and uh, extend the framework for himself. Maybe he'll do that, maybe he'll just try and go clear across the board, develop something like this, who knows? But White knew he didn't want that. He didn't want that variation. So the question became to Black is, where is the largest point? I mean, do we say, oh no, he's got an extension, I'm going to make sure that he can't get an enclosure? We could have done that. Instead, Black simply answered the move that was omitted. He made certain that White's not going to be able to do that. He's not going to be able to settle uh, at this point ever again. Now, if he wants this group of his to settle, it has to run away. Or it has to 
press against something, or it's got, it needs more moves, essentially, that's probably out towards the center, if he actually wants to settle here. So instead of doing, you know, splitting, or approaching, or whatever else, he simply said, no, you could have settled here, you didn't, and now I'm going to make sure that you can't. He was essentially making certain that white didn't have a chance to go back and finish this. Which is a very, very large move to play. I mean, this entire upper uh, right-hand corner now is feeling pressure because of this. White has no choice. I mean, even if he was hoping to get some kind of uh, framework on the left, he has no choice but to go back and settle here. Otherwise, this entire group's going to be in trouble. So he tries to settle, and Black's simply going to follow him because of that, and make certain that uh, bottom right area is pretty much going to be his now because of it. So that was a really great way of finding out where the largest point on the board is. I mean, we could have gone off and did, done something else, or we could have just made sure that uh, White can't go back and finish what was available to him. That really large settling move. Uh, in this game, players were, uh, uh, I don't remember, uh, Kongji versus, I don't know, some Japanese professional. I do not have them memorized as well as I do their Chinese and Korean counterparts. Sorry. But it was a fairly interesting game. Uh, Kung Chi is black, yes. And in fact, there were actually, now that I think about it, there were a few more interesting uh, things to note about this particular game in terms of how to find the largest move. Because in the course of White trying to settle, without, you know, giving away too much... Er, wait a minute. Did I have that right? No, I don't. That's just retarded. Dupe. Dupe, dupe, dupe. There we go. That's better. So in the course of uh, White trying to settle, we come back with situations where no one's really in danger of being completely surrounded and killed. So we have to constantly go back and figure out where's the largest point. Do we have Sente? Can we play elsewhere? And a uh, little... Battles like this will definitely test your sense of knowing where the largest point on the board is. Here, for example, if we aren't careful, these two stones, if black was to come down, can easily start to be surrounded again. So white doesn't want to let that happen. We could, again, play move elsewhere, Alright, see you, Super Kalen. But what happens when Black starts to enlarge the bottom again by attacking these stones? Um, in a fight like this, we're not, well, that would be this idea. That would be White going off and playing elsewhere. Because this is not in immediate danger of being surrounded. But in higher level games, Simply the idea that we're going to have to keep running this away is one that we don't want to have to see. We recognize that taking a goat tape move elsewhere is not going to be worth our group constantly being on the run. So playing a move elsewhere, for example, like this, is probably going to again be considered slow simply because there were weak groups on the board, and you did nothing about it. And what you'll find in your games is if you keep trying to take uh, those slow Gote moves, your opponent's going to take uh, faster moves which are going to directly threaten you, and suddenly, as if by magic, they're going to start getting territory that you never really saw coming. Because that's what you were trying to do. You were trying to take your enclosure, your extension, or whatever, and they got 10 moves in the middle of the board while they chased you around, and suddenly they've got this huge framework there. And you'll begin to realize the importance of 
oh yeah, we need to look after our weak groups. We need to make sure they're not getting surrounded. Because though we would like to take a uh, move, you know, elsewhere on the board, it's just not going to be worth it. Experience alone will teach us that. And for the same reason, we do not see black going ahead and, uh, I don't know, securing this, or approaching here, or whatever else. Because he knows that once this group, start, once his cutting stones start to get attacked, that's going to be worth way too much as well. So he keeps responding until he's going to be nicely settled. Black doesn't, white doesn't want to be completely surrounded, so he keeps responding. At which point black gets to attack his group again. Let's see, is there anything else in here I wanted to point out? Um... Let's see, with this group, I don't think so. I seem to recall most of the rest of this is going to be complicated fighting. That's not going to be good for our purposes, so let's go to something else. Back to here, there we go. Um, what else was I going to point out? Now, of course, there are exceptions. There are, of course, exceptions. Like I mentioned uh, in the beginning, Yes, I do like sticking away. Well, actually, let's do something different with that. Uh, let's do this and maybe here. I do like sticking away from those uh, kind of halfway points. But even the one I mentioned has an exception. Like this, for example, is not the same as if it was on a 4-4 four, uh, four point. As if he was approaching a 4-4 four, four point. I mean, here, you're not really applying pressure to your opponent. You're not really taking a large move away from him. Not really getting t uh, territory for yourself. I guess it can be an alright move on this particular board, but I like staying away from them. Now, if that move had another purpose, let's say you identified an enclosure that your opponent had, and you know that the largest move for your opponent is to get uh, an extension because of how easy it is for them to make territory with an extension from an enclosure, suddenly that, okay, that, that is a good move. That's not uh, slow, that's not halfway, uh, as I was mentioning. That suddenly actually has a purpose. So that's really where this lecture becomes very, very difficult. Because there's a you, you try to give rules for this, but it's go. It's really, really annoying in that there's almost always going to be an exception for just about everything you can possibly say. A lot of fun that way. A lot of fun that way. Is it common to extend after enclosure? Um, yeah, because it's really, really simple to... Uh, essentially what you're doing with, when you're enclosing, uh, if I can get the right tool here, derp, 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 and you go away. Essentially what you're doing by enclosing is you're kind of creating a little wall around a patch of territory. And if you can extend and make another wall, how is your opponent going to live anywhere in here? They're just not. I mean, you have a strong position, you've extended to a strong position, and the idea that they can live back in here is ludicrous, essentially. Which is why in most games, the minute you see an enclosure get slapped down, unless there's something really, really, really important on the board, someone's going to take that extension away. Subsequently, we also sometimes see that in the reverse. If, for some example, for some reason or another, Black had an extension already here, we wouldn't want them to get an enclosure to go with it. Same thing. We could play else. Well, that's a bad example because white doesn't have the corner there. Derp, derp, derp. There we go. I mean, we could play elsewhere. We could do, I don't know, something like this, let's say. And live. Uh, very obvious, Jaseki. Equal on both parts. But 
approaching that way is really, really slow. That allows Black to suddenly get a nice amount of territory with an extension, and suddenly how are we going to reduce that? If we don't, it's going to grow out of control. It's just way too easy for Black to use. And we don't have a move that we can play that's similar. So we usually try to avoid that kind of thing. Oh, what was the other example I was going to use? The other example was kind of difficult. Yeah, the other example I was going to use uh, for this lecture, I just could not come up with a uh, good example of it on my own. It's something that I have talked about occasionally, though. And I think this is probably for the stronger players watching. But let's say you're in a game. This is going to get complicated for a minute. I'm not going to go over it very well. It doesn't really matter. I picked it simply because it's complicated. There's a lot of different uh, things going on, so when I stop, it becomes a bit difficult to figure out where that largest point is. So that's why I picked it. So for now, I'm just going to go through this really quick because none of this matters for our purposes. Some of you stronger players can already probably follow and realize, you know, why the moves that are being picked are, uh... Uh, good moves, that is. Why they aren't slow. But for our purposes, that's irrelevant. That doesn't matter. Uh, doot, doot. And last two. Here we go. So essentially, what we wind up having here, and this is where I intended to keep. So what's essentially what we have wind up having here is a bit of a mess on the board and trying to find out what is slow and what isn't, where those uh, larger points on the board are, uh, it's a bit complicated with all that's going on in the board, all, with all that is going on. It is a little bit complicated, and there's probably multiple uh, good answers as to what could be the largest move. But what I wanted to focus on is with these last two moves, right, the last corner gets enclosed. There aren't any really weak groups on the board. I mean, white is pretty much okay here out in the middle. Black has a tremendous amount of space on the bottom, on the left, so that's fine. Uh, white all connected, so this group is pretty safe. Is there Aji here at E3? Yes, there is. Corner is in no danger of dying anytime soon. And, of course, Black's enclosure is strong, and Black isn't about to die on the upper left either. So we have nothing that's really in danger of being killed. Uh, the corners are already taken. So, this is essentially an example of where people start having trouble finding the largest move on the board. Because, if something needed to have another move, or it was going to be completely surrounded, that's pretty easy to see. We don't want to be surrounded in our games. So, not allowing us to, ourselves to be surrounded is generally really, really large. Uh, subsequently, surrounding your opponent is also generally really, really large. Um, corners are taken, so nothing to approach. Can't just, you know, slap a stone down by a 3-4 point and say, pick at your seki and go from there, see what happens. Uh, question, is D7 not threatening to kill? D7... Uh, no. If d7 cuts through, black is still going to live just fine on the left-hand side, because there is way too much space there. Can't kill it. 
but we do have options here for white. I mean, as Wainbot has just mentioned, we could slice through this and take ourselves, you know, a little bit of a little bit of a wall here. Only trouble is, like I mentioned, even if you are putting pressure on your opponent, can live fairly easy by threatening to connect underneath. And if you don't respond to that, suddenly that's all territory for your opponent. So, we probably don't want to make that exchange just yet. We could play some forcing moves, like this, for example. Could play this, could play this. Good into response. After that, we can certainly extend. Possible, possible. We could play more moves on the very bottom and make sure that e3 make sure that e3 isn't going to uh, live anytime soon I'm not going to come back and haunt us with that I mean all of these moves they make sense so how the freak do you decide what to play that's a tough one that really is a tough one and as Seno has mentioned um Looking at Black's extension along the right-hand side, he says he doesn't want to get that. He doesn't want to let his opponent uh, solidify this extension here. And that's also an interesting idea. But it's more interesting for reasons than you might be aware of. For example, let's say White did take the top idea. The top is open, we're going to get some territory there maybe be able to use our influence that we've obtained uh, over here for something. Maybe that was going to be our idea, and that's what we're going to try and do. Well, trouble is, nothing is in danger of dying, but things can still be attacked. Such as this corner. What happens, for example... Uh, how to handle this? Let's... Do it a little bit unreasonably, but I want to do it just to subtle. There we go. Let's say uh, Black attacks your corner, keeping you almost completely surrounded, but just for that extra influence. I mean, White's still alive. White obviously isn't going to die anytime soon. But it's now a little bit harder to come into this area with this group becoming stronger, especially if, for example... Uh, maybe Black makes an, uh, another large point here, now that he's strengthened himself, in order to take territory there. Maybe Black will try and go after the move that you just played, in order to extend the right-hand side, to gain more for himself. I mean, that's possible too. Maybe you played something completely different, there's a weak group, and you can get Sensei off of that. I mean, there's a lot of different uh, ways to use this uh, bit of influence that Black's obtained for himself in the bottom right-hand corner. So instead of wait around, waiting around to see when Black's gonna make an exchange similar to this one and start developing and suddenly growing an area that we can't match, As Sano suggested, white goes and attacks. I mean, he could have done a number of different things. He had options above, below, in the general middle area. But he's worried about his opponent's development. He decided the fastest thing he can do on the board right now is make certain that from this enclosure, Black can't do multiple things at once. Those multiple things being harass our corner group, which would be pretty severe, and make more territory along the right-hand side. So he's going to pick a fight here in order to ensure those things don't take place. Now, Black still wants some territory there, so he pincers back creating a heck of a mess here. 
we're all going to save our stones, because if they die, then we know that there's a lot of territory that was just obtained by our opponent, so we don't want to do that. Um, let's see, how far was I going to go into this variation? Um, a little bit, I guess. I'll go into it a little bit. So, black comes out, right, right, right. White tries to bring back alive his previously almost dead stone for the Aji, because we're trying to surround our two stones here. Black is still threatening to be surrounded, so he's not going to play elsewhere. That would be really small. If we went off and, I don't know, did something like this right now, we would be able to happily expect our opponent just flat out killing us. And that would be kind of large for him. So we definitely don't want to play elsewhere yet. You can easily see it's a large move to keep jumping out. Protect our shape. Here is where it becomes a little bit more difficult, because it's harder to imagine that you can be surrounded here as, as black. But, we can also keep attacking these two stones that were never defended. So again, we could go back and play a larger move on the top of the board, or a not, that's deceptive, um, we could play a move for territory in Gote on the top of the board if we're worried about, you know, points, or maybe we're trying to secure our lead or something, or maybe, maybe, maybe we'll even play this way instead and get our territory that way. But... Especially in this case, this doesn't begin to take advantage of White's weak group, and you know he's going to take advantage of yours. The minute he jumps out, pressure's back on Black, and suddenly we don't know how we're going to continue running or living, we have no shape, this is a problem. And like I mentioned, if there's something weak on the board, protecting it or attacking it, may just be an important move. So, black gets shape and attacks. White doesn't want to die. Black really, really wants him to. And by attacking it, we can see the profit. This area here wasn't territory yet, but black's getting in uh, some free moves simply by harassing this group. He gets to defend himself, making it almost impossible to reduce that area anymore. So he's picking up solid points. He still has a weak group that he can attack. He's getting shape in the center. So a whole large list of headaches that could have been uh, at White's advantage if he had if Black had made a small move, for example, and played away and allowed White to uh, just continue attacking at will, don't have to worry about any of that anymore. None of that's going to come to pass. Because, I mean, from here, maybe, I don't know, maybe White gets to invade in here as well, making sure the territory there isn't going to work. And then suddenly, I guess we're going to have multiple weak groups running around. All because we took... Uh, those Gote points. Oops, 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 way too far back. Doop, 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 doop. Alright, that's where I didn't want to go. Uh, I wanted to go here. There we go. Right, right, right. Alright, here we go. And, of course, white goes out. Now, we could debate if this is a good move or not, for a while, we're not going to. We're not going to. Suffice it to say, both players judged quite correctly that the largest thing on the board was those weak groups. 
if we don't attack the stone in the very beginning, then it just opens up this uh, potential for Black to develop essentially at will. He can do whatever he wants. He can keep pressuring us. He can keep developing off a very large enclosure. Really good for him. If that's not what I was looking for. If while we were attacking... Never find that variation again, am I? This tree is just utter destruction. Uh, la, 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 la. Here we go. If while we were attacking at any point we lost focus and tried to be greedy and take just Gote territory, then either our group will be chased to the ends of the earth or it'll even flat out die. So once again, pretty easy to tell where the largest point is there. And essentially it's one of the largest things that I really try and get across to my students on when they're looking for uh, large groups or large uh, points on the board. I always keep going back to see if they can identify weak groups. I try to always have them look for weak groups. Because playing a move in Gote, just for solid points, can be okay. But only if things like this don't happen. Either your group is simply going to flat out be killed in one more move, if your group isn't going to be chased to the ends of the earth, if you can't do that to your opponent. Because if, let's say, this didn't even happen. Let's say, um, I don't know. Completely different game. Let's say that's not even there. Let's just get rid of this. Why not? Let's say for some reason this enclosure wasn't actually on the board, and Black played away to enclose. Uh, I'd still say it's probably not worth as much as ensuring that White... Ouch. Uh, as ensuring that White can never harass your weak group ever again. I think White's definitely going to get more out of this harassment than you spent on um, enclosing that corner in Gote. So there are a few different ways that we can actually find those large points. We could do, like I mentioned at the very beginning of the game, we could count to see what's the largest part of the board and glue our eye there that maybe that's probably something that we should be looking at. And to an extent, that's true. For similar reasons, if we adjust this one stone, even to a 3-4 rather than a 4-4, then suddenly this is the largest area of the board, and subsequently approaching that 3-4 point is the right thing to do. If instead, uh... Yeah, that happens. Uh, what was I saying? If instead uh, it's 4-4, four, four, it's all equal, yeah, you can take the largest uh, area of the board for yourself. You can certainly approach everything we've talked about so far. That's, that's one way of doing it. Another way... Um, I'm never finding these variations. Nope. No, I am not. One last token effort. Ah, yeah, here we go. The whole uh, completing what your opponent didn't, for example. That's definitely a nice way of uh, keeping our eye on those uh, large points. Did your opponent deviate in Jiseki somewhere? Did they leave a Jiseki? Uh, is there a move that they really need in order to respond, in order to get a base and live uh, comfortably, if they've forgotten one of those kinds of uh, moves, then yeah, most definitely. Probably going to be 
larger to make certain that you can capitalize on that than taking, you know, go tape, go tape points for yourself elsewhere. And as I showed, we saw this even in professional games. Um, and of course, the harder to see one, the one where you're getting into, like, can I find that variation? Oh, I can! Huzzah! And of course, the harder to uh, see one, the one where we're getting into mid-game. We know that there's no longer uh, corners to take. Sides are either spoken for or difficult, but we can predict when we're going to be attacked. We can see the pressure that the stone's going to be placing on us, making sure that that's not going to take place, rather than playing some, you know, Gote extension, as I mentioned, and instead ensuring that horrible fate doesn't befall us definitely tends to be worth uh, more than just taking solid points. And yes, as Brodwith mentioned, I... if you need more sleep aids, I do upload these onto YouTube. So uh, you can visit my channel. If you're ever suffering from insomnia, feel free to do that. Let's see, did I have another... Yep, no problem. Did I have another professional example? I don't think I did. Uh, instead, I want to take a second and ask if any of you had questions. About anything I've gone over, about slow moves in general. Fraud with kind of has one. Okay, what's your question? When you've got a 3-4 with said extension. Uh, dupe, dupe. Kind of like you... okay. R5, yeah. Um, just put that over there, I guess. Yeah. You can never figure out when the right time for K5 is. Alright. Um, that's going to depend a little bit on what's going on on the board. Uh, if the board is as empty as this one, we can see that we do have one extension for ourselves. Uh, let's go away with that one too. We see that we have one extension for ourselves, but there is another that we can take. So I would go for that second extension before we play a move like K5. Because K5, certainly, if we want to get uh, all, you know, county about this, we can see that we're trying to take, you know, this much potential territory for ourselves. Whereas, want to buy clear all function. Whereas, if we go back and take that larger, that uh, other move, we can see that the amount of potential territory we're trying to obtain for ourselves is a lot larger, because it's not just this area at the moment. We're potentially trying to take the other side of it as well, so we've got a enormous amount of potential. Don't confuse this with actual territory. You still need a fair number of moves before that happens. But really quickly, you can judge that this is a lot larger than just what you would obtain with K5. So that unfortunately does come down to a matter of value. If there isn't anything on the board that is weak, if there isn't anything on the board, um, well, either yours or your opponent's, that is. So nothing, on, nothing to harass, nothing to defend. If the corners are already spoken for, and it's just a really boring game where nothing's really going on. My version of boring is, you know, nothing to attack. Then yeah, probably time to take uh, K5. No, you can get into some boring games. You definitely will get into some boring games. 
Um, and yeah, uh, sorry about the swords. Uh, let's say you're playing a piece, uh, orthodox. Your opponent decides to try to give you your framework because he's really, really nice like that. Um, let's say da, 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 da. he's gonna take something for himself. What's he gonna do? What's he gonna do? So he does that. So you approach, and you get to extend on your. Well, actually, no. You're not gonna do that. You're not gonna do that. You don't. You don't want to play his same trick that he's been playing. No, 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 no. You're gonna play this instead. And he does something like I don't know this. Well, one move that you can potentially play right now is here. I mean, it's possible. I cannot say this is a bad move. I personally like to be more aggressive. I would be wanting to reduce him more than just securing my own territory because that's what makes me most comfortable. Or I would want to be greedily expanding along what I do have. I usually prioritize moves my opponent has to respond to as being larger than ones I can take in Gote. Because I know the minute I take that stone in Gote, my opponent's going to probably be making certain that I'm going to be responding to him for a very long time now. Um, <laughs> I don't want to say that. He said the T word. Ah, Tengen. Can you take Tengen here? Um, yeah, as Ukasus mentioned, you can take it, but if you're going to take this, I would much rather this be a higher stone. Because a low stone means that he can think about a lot of different ways to reduce this. He can think about shoulder hits, he can think about caps. If he really, really wants to get aggressive, he can just flat out attach to your third line stone, and you're going to have to respond, so he's going to get something in there. Whereas, if the stone was fourth line, suddenly, you know, the shoulder hits are a lot less likely, because he probably doesn't want to get just hand you fourth line territory on a plate. Uh, caps are just bizarre against the fourth line stone. We don't we don't uh, never see them, but they're usually doing something else. Um, so yeah, if I, I wouldn't probably play Tengen if uh, that stone was low. If it was high, a little bit harder to reduce me, yeah, I could see Tengen theoretically being played. But again, my style, I don't like playing Gote moves like that. I like doing something my opponent's got to respond to. In this case, I would still go die. There we go. I would still much rather even do something like this to uh, build up. Um, maybe something a bit more active. See if I can't... Uh, da -da 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 -da. See if I can't shoulder him to respond. Or maybe just invade him? Probably not invade him. Maybe just M15 if Q15 is high. Q10, sorry. M15? M15... Here? Hmm. I'm gonna play M15. I think I'd rather play Q... Uh, play Q16. Because this is Gote, right? Whereas this is gonna be Sente. You are forward on, so I'm sure you know what you're doing. This seems like a reasonable move. I'm just nitpicking. I like my opponent responding to me. Uh, what about H16? Another good question. Because I find a move. Uh, for bl ooh, that's a good question. What you just came up with is you decided that you wanted to reduce your opponent. 
good. Nice first idea. You're being decisive. You're saying, I decided I don't want to expand. I want to reduce. I like that. You're making, yeah, that's, that's good. You're making a decision. However, the second part of that is how can I do that in a way that's not going to result in me crying? Because if we don't find a way where we can actually get a base and let's say our opponent attacks us, well then we're probably going to start crying as we suddenly find ourselves just jumping across the board in the hope that we're not going to be killed. So yeah, we've reduced, but we're also being reduced because this huge wall that we're giving our opponent, you'll find allows your opponent to reduce where hit or reduce you wherever he wants. Because as long as you have somewhere to go to, then you can do this. Let's say for example, this was a bit different. Let's give ten gen grumble grumble grumble. Let's say we had 10 gen, and I'm just going to arbitrarily put a few stones in here, something nice and strong in the middle that we can't, you know, surround or do whatever with. And, yeah, we're playing a 29 cube or whatever. And then we played a move like this. Well, now it's not as bad, because sure, white can still play that uh, move to try to attack us and surround us, but we've got a group that we can immediately run to. We're not going to be running very far. One stone, maybe two stones tops, and then we're connected up. So that's fine. That reduction makes sense. But if you can't envision how you can get a base, then you might want to rethink if you're really reducing your, your opponent, or if you're giving him essentially a bullseye on the board. Because if they spot weakness, they will come after you. They're kind of like sharks in that regard. And if you put a stone down that essentially can't live locally, can't even make one eye locally, then all you're doing is just throwing blood in the water. So be careful of that. Uh, welcome back, Super Kalen. And yes, you are correct. Were there any other questions? All right, uh, Tenrai had a question. What's up? Let's move my mouse so I can actually read your question. There we go. A large move could be about territory or about strength or influence, right? Um, yeah. I mean, an example of that is what we actually just saw here. I mean, the difference between this, and this is more territorially inclined, this is more along the lines of saying, you know what, maybe I can still expand off here and get influence. Ooh, which is more interesting? Um... Uh, I'm not going to say it depends on style. Hmm. That does have so many different answers, though. Uh, it partially depends on you. Let's say you're a Q-level player. Let's say, I don't know, 5, 6K or something. And you've decided for yourself that you absolutely hate influence. You can never use it properly. So you're going to completely avoid it, and you're always going to play low moves for territory, yada, yada, yada. Then I would say that you should probably play the move for strength and influence instead. The reason being is because that's a really horrible reason not to play something. You need to get better at it, because it's part of the game. It will teach you a lot, such as how to reduce, and a whole list of different things I'm not going to go into right now. And overall, it'll probably just help you. You can't really avoid it. If you're a down-level player and you just don't like that, that makes a little bit more sense because you have a bit more of an understanding about the game. You uh, know a lot of different things that can happen to you and cannot. Whereas as a Q, you probably really haven't delved that deep into it yet. So there's that. Uh, another thing depends on what your opponent's playing. Let's say your opponent, you notice that your opponent is first playing for territory. 
And I'm going to play a really, really retarded example to show this, too. Let's say your... Oops, that's not the right one. Let's say you're black, and you notice that your opponent really, really wants territory, as evidenced by the dual 3-3 three, three points he immediately placed on the board. Now, you open up nice and flexibly. You've got a 4-4 four, four, and a 3-4, which means you can go territory, you can go influence, you can pretty much do whatever you want. But is it really a good idea to try to out-influence this heavily... In he or not out-influence, sorry. Is it a good idea for you to try to out-territory this person who is clearly heavily into the... already heavily into a territorial kind of game? Uh, gonna go with probably not there. Trying to outdo your opponent at their own game can be fun, might be a little bit difficult. Instead, I would be using this simply for the way it's intended. It's like, okay, this is kind of on the small side because I can get really fast frameworks while you're just, you know, picking up territory. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to go and get myself a really fast framework. You can pick up the territory and we'll see whose idea was better. Something along those lines. So it can also depend on what your opponent's doing. Never forget what your opponent's doing, because he's kind of there also playing. You can't just say, I'm going to play this way, if your opponent is saying, no, you can't. I mean, by that same rationale, if your opponent suddenly, um, let's get rid of everything again. Hello. Um, let's say your opponent opened up with freaking Tenken. Is it, then, a good idea... Um, whatever, let's pass and give away another move. Is it, then, a good idea to say that you're going to out-influence this? Maybe not. Might not be a good idea. I mean, those are just two really, really extreme examples because they show the point the easiest. Uh, but I think you get the idea. Yes, try to out-influence Ghost Sagan. Come back to me, let me know how that works out for you. Uh, if there are no other questions, then I will end this part of the lecture here. I will probably... Sure, you can ask one more. I'll probably uh, continue this particular theme with more professional examples. Oh, sure. Show example. Uh, where are you? You are six. QI qu oh, right, question mark. There we go. You got control. I'll probably continue exploring this theme of where to find the uh, largest move with more professional examples. Uh, my next lecture. Yeah! Okay, that's better. Mm-hmm. Very true, very true. Um... I won't say it's slow. I will say it's a bit risky, because you know, looking at this board, exactly where all of your opponent's territory is coming from. It's right on the bottom of the board. I mean, that's the only development that he's, at the moment, um, pursuing. So that makes it a little bit easier to figure out, you know, how am I going to reduce this? Because you can immediately look at, okay, well, this is going to be large later on, because that's going to be Sente. Uh, if I get a chance to cap him or whatever, that's going to be nice too, and maybe if he defends it, I can connect it up and try and grow an area larger than he is. So, you know, th that makes your life a lot easier in a lot of respects. Um, here, I wouldn't be panicking about this. I just take my territory, because keep in mind, when we actually start counting things like this, that area isn't as frightening as you think it is. Let's get rid of Sente again. 
and just do some derpy influence, derpy uh, end game kind of things. I mean, if end game goes at all well for White, and you know what? No, that's just cheating. Let's just let's just say derp derp, McDerp. There we are. And we go and count this out, and we find that our opponent is having maybe about 10 points of territory there, and let's say, what are we going to get, 20, 25 here? Alright, let's say 25 there, but we also have Komi, so, um, well, you know, now we're over 30, happily enough. Question is, no, screw that, pass. So the question is, where in this structure that Black's creating is there 30 points? And we can pretty count that really, really fast. I mean, the great thing about this is you can just go, you know, well, that's obviously 14. But I'm going to click it out. And this is obviously 21. So we're still not there yet. Uh, again, still not there yet. There we go. Somewhere around there is a 31 point of territory. It, yeah, it does. It really, really does. It looks enormous and people panic all about it. But between the two corners you have in Komi, you're still even. So they can't just develop this. They, it just doesn't work. It's way too slow if this is all the territory that they try and take for themselves. They've got to branch out and do something else. Mm -hmm. I stopped playing games like this for that reason. Yeah, and some of those points aren't there yet. That's true. Um, well, in this instance, uh, when they jumped out like this, I would definitely take this immediately because one, it actually threatens larger endgame than I showed. You know, all of this for example. Makes for better endgame, but I, I wasn't going to give white both of them. Like, I was just going to say white gets one side or the other and not both. Uh, so yeah, large corner and great endgame so far. So I would definitely take D2 because it keeps this area pretty simple. I know from experience, I don't even have to count this anymore, that I know this is still about equal, so I'm fine. It, l it feels like a slow move to a lot of people until we actually count it. If we play elsewhere, we play, I don't know, somewhere derpy, and we don't defend, our opponent gets in here and steals our corner, suddenly, okay, now we're in really really big trouble because our corner is gone they're still making the points that we just showed and now this wall has to make a base somehow and even after it makes a base it can potentially still be attacked so problems so instead of this what you usually see in professional games is after um after here, after the Hane, we let him connect, get some influence, so we can go back and try and use this. Because if we fight this, it's just ridiculous. Oh, as Ukusu's even mentioned. So yeah, we usually don't give away our 3-3 for that reason. And why this is still a very large move. Uh, you mentioned it without being specific. Um, oh, yep, sorry. Imagine mentioned it before, even Ukasus. Sorry about that, Imagine. there's nothing else, uh, then thank you all for stopping by. I will be continuing to explore this particular uh, theme week after next, I think. What is week after next? Is that the 11th? Uh, yes, it is.
might have to change the date on that lecture, we'll find out. But my next lecture, whenever it is, it will still be continuing this, because it's really, really huge, there's so much to cover, and I just can't cover all of it in one lecture. So thanks for stopping by, hope you all have a very good week, or weeks, I guess, and I shall hope to see you all next time.